Hey everyone online, welcome to 1208 Greenwood. We're just getting ready to start and to everybody in person. More people joining us in a bit. We're going to sing some worship songs, so thanks for watching. All right, as people trickle in, if you ever decide that you want some more pizza, last week we ran out, so we bought extra. And at the moment, people are still coming. So if you want more, grab it. Uh, you can take on whatever posture you'd like as we worship, but if you would, would you start by standing with us? Sing it. If you don't know, sing it anyways.
This next song is a little newer. Uh, we taught it recently and sang it a few times, so if you've been with us for a bit, you probably know it by now, and then uh, we'll have some others to know as well. But God, we welcome you into this building. We thank you for the free-flowing grace of Jesus who loves us with his own life and his own death and his own resurrection. And when we put our faith in him, he extends all of that life and death and resurrection all to us. We thank you for a world that is being made new. We thank you that despite the bad things that we see in our lives in the world today, one time, at one point, that will all pass, that will all go. We thank you for the passion that you invest in your love, that it's not just a, a love that's far away, it's not this distant feeling, but it's something that comes so close to us that it's inside of us, that your Holy Spirit is willing to subject himself to our bodies as sacred spaces. thing into sacred space, but right now you're in us, that we are sacred space, that where we go, people might catch glimpses of the resurrection already, in the ways that we live, in the ways that we act. We know that one day your spirit will become so manifest on this earth that uh, everything will be changed, that the sun will shine forever. For you are light, life abundant. Though we don't always taste that in the world today, we catch glimpses of it in one another, in your church, not a building, but in people. So let's catch a glimpse tonight of you, in one another, in your spirit, your angels join us in worshiping you, or we join the angels in worshiping you, whether it's one way or the other or both, may you find our praise tonight to be a meaningful and tangible sacrifice to you.
going to face hard times in this life. You yourself had to face it. But you also knew the glorious ending of the resurrection. You knew that though this world is screwed up right now, one day it would be brought into perfection. We'd be given resurrected bodies. We would come back to the earth. We would live in a renewed heaven, a renewed earth, where everything that was ever wrong was done away with, burned away with, and all that's left is goodness, rightness, righteousness, justice, morality. So though we may sing songs crying out, we know that everything is going to be all right. We know that it sometimes feels a little overshadowed by this world. But Jesus, you sang that song to us, recognizing the end of the story, which is actually the beginning of another spiritual age to come, the beginning of the resurrection. It's not the end, that's just start to eternity. And so we rest assured that you knew that in the end, everything will be all right. Despite what difficulty we face right now, despite uh, how far our faithfulness to you might sometimes get us in trouble, at the end of all things, every little thing will be all right. As you wipe away every tear from our eyes. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name. quick announcements for you starting with uh, masks I know uh, we just kind of put out the memo yesterday as the board's just kind of been looking at articles and projections as to where things are maybe headed with the Delta strain uh, variant and things like that we just realized that there's a lot of unknowns at the moment and at least one of the knowns that seems to be on the table is an increase in cases I want to tell you right now like we're not coming here afraid we're not like masking up because we're in anxiety or terrified. We're just practicing precaution for one another to show a little bit of love, uh, recognizing that there's too many unknowns right now to just uh, um, come and feel fully free to cough on one another and all that. So it's, it's temporary. When we see that it doesn't seem like uh, we need to be too worried about it, we'll of course remove it just like we did last time. Uh, but for the time being, thanks for being gracious with us and flexible with us as we uh, just try to practice a little bit of precaution. So if you ever come on a Sunday and you forget your mask, we've got boxes at the front. We still have pizza every week, come at 540. Uh, we may eventually end up kind of eating outside again and then moving inside, but we are still moving forward. We have absolutely no uh, expectation to end up again in an online only type service. But at the same time, I do want you to know if your life sorry, your health is especially at risk, which we've served a lot of medically at risk people over the last decade here at 1208. If that happens to be you, just know that we offer two ways that you can engage online. One is Jackson Cloud. It's an online church that we started and attempts to give people the space to meet online if they can't come in person. Uh, so you can go to jacksoncloud, jxncloud.com for that. Or you can watch online. We've always had a pretty poor looking streaming service. It was just an iPad sitting on a stand, but now it's an iPad sitting on a pole. And it's got different camera angles and we think it sounds a little better. Uh, so with that being said, uh, we're offering a little bit of a nicer system with uh, what we're able to work with at the time. If you want to give, you can give online at 12waygreenwood.com. There's a PayPal account right there. It's free for you. You don't even need a PayPal account to do it. You can just use a debit card. If you prefer cash or check, there's a box right here. Before you leave at the end of the night, you can just throw something in there, and we'll grab that as well. We have a few groups going on at the moment, 5.30, 7.30 on Tuesdays at the NAPS, which is towards Walmart. They're over here. Talk to them if you'd like to get involved in their group. 
And then Thursdays at my house, two blocks that way, from six to eight on Thursdays, we get together, we watch a Bible project video, which is short and really great. We talk about it for a few minutes, then we hang out, play games, eat food, have a good time. Uh, 1208 bands, we've mentioned that these are coming up. I want to now give you the official dates. They'll be happening here in the church building, uh, and they will be starting, men's group will be August 18th. Wednesdays at 7 o'clock, and they meet every other week. Women's group starts August 26th, so they'll always be Wednesdays at 7 o'clock, but the weeks will change as to, you know, if it's men or women's each week. And I know we at 1208 always can't remember what's going on on any given week and whose turn it is, so mark it down on your calendars if you want to join us. It's going to be a really great time to get together and confess our sins to one another. Aren't you excited? Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. It's a good time, though, to just come and say, here's what I'm dealing with. I'd like to put it out there, receive forgiveness, but then also uh, have you ask me what the Holy Spirit's doing in my life so that I can tell you what I think he's doing, so that I can see what he's doing, so that these testimonies are encouraging us and moving us forward. Bands have always been a um, mark of the Wesleyan movement, to which our church is a part of, and the Free Methodist Church. And we just thought, hey, let's uh, try to go back to our roots a little bit and see how it works. Uh, the men's group will meet for six weeks, and the women's group will meet for five or six weeks since it's starting a little later. Every other week, one hour. We hope you'll try it out. If you're interested in volunteering for children's ministry, Mark Edwards is in the back here waving his hand. I uh, talked to him. He would love to have you get involved. We're looking for members. If you're not a member, we can make you a member. Just talk to me, and we'll go from there. Okay. <clears throat> With that being said, let's go ahead and move into our message. We've been going through the book of Romans, which, man, I thought Revelation was always, like, the hardest book to, like, explain. But the more that I dove into that one, the more I... I like felt like as I was wrestling with it that I, I could understand it a bit more clearly. clearly. <laughs> but when it comes to Romans, man, sometimes I just find that this particular book, I can struggle through a little bit. Let me hit a button here. Uh... So as we get into today's message, I need to tell you the story of the very first uh, I don't even know what word we would use. Uh, the very first, that's eh, not quite the right expression. We're going to talk about the, the first person in which the covenant of God is put on. And his name is Abraham. You've heard the song, you've read the story maybe, Father Abraham, many sons. Many sons said, Father Abraham, you, you know the deal. Abraham was uh, found right after the Tower of Babel. So at the Tower of Babel, God essentially says, none of these people are following me. I've given them many chances. We flooded the whole earth. We started over again. I've given them the rules. And yet here they are just once again chasing after something other than me. So you know what? I'm going to turn all of these people over to their own nations I'm going to assign some of the spiritual beings of heaven to look over those nations. And then I'm going to choose one guy. And he's going to be my nation. So God looks out there and he finds Abraham. He says, that's the guy. All the other nations can follow some of these other spiritual beings that I've appointed over them. But this guy, Abraham, he's mine. He follows me. And so God goes to Abraham and you have to understand the mindset that Abraham probably lived in in his time. It's possible that he did not know who his God was. That he did not know Yahweh, the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the King of kings. The God of the whole universe. Because in ancient culture, there were lots of little G gods. There were lots of mythologies to go after. People had family gods. <laughs> like as though spiritual beings were assigned to specific families. Nations had national gods that were assigned over nations. And so it's very likely that Abraham grew up in his father's house knowing about different kinds of gods that perhaps he followed, different nations that he fell under. But God comes up to him and he says, Abraham, 
I want you to go to the land that I will show you. Which is super vague and super God, right? <laughs> that's, that's just a God kind of prophetic where like, okay, you need to clarify. Where am I going? Oh, it's to the land I'll show you. Where, but where, you know? <laughs> but Abraham has this experience with God himself, though he may not know it's the God of the universe. He has this experience and he steps out in faith and trust and belief and decides to walk blindly towards whatever this land that God will show him is. And so he heads out. And then Abraham arrives at the land and guess who he meets there? God himself. He meets God face to face. In the form in the Old Testament that we call the angel of the Lord. God, it says, the Lord, caps lock, so Yahweh appeared to Abraham. Which is, whenever God appears to someone in the Old Testament, it's always this angel of the Lord who is God. And so the angel of the Lord appears to him and tells him, this whole land over here that you see, this whole land of Canaan and beyond, I'm going to give you this land. And so... He tells Abraham this. And Abraham has this crazy moment where he has met a spiritual being. Maybe he knows it's the God of the universe, or maybe he just knows it's a spiritual being. He's not sure, perhaps. But he met this spiritual being, and he's had this experience. And so he sets up an altar to God, because he realizes if you've met a spiritual being in this location, this must be sacred space on the earth. Because God was present here. So he sets up an altar. And Abraham, throughout his journey forward through Genesis, is going to run into God in person in front of him several times. It's interesting how many times God appears to Abraham in physical form. You know the story of like right before Sodom and Gomorrah? Abraham's camping out in sacred space. He usually finds God by trees. And Abraham has intentionally set up his tent by trees because he... He thinks of trees as sacred space where he meets God. Guess who comes walking out of the oaks? It's God. Just the Lord walks up. Yahweh walks up with two angels beside him. And Abraham recognizes him as though he's just run into someone at Meyer. Hey, Robbie, how you doing? That's how face-to-face -face Abraham is used to God. That when Abraham sees God at a distance in physical form... He recognizes him. He knows him. So the idea, first off, I just want to say this. A lot of times we belittle Abraham to be like, if I believe that God exists, therefore I must have faith. First off, everyone in the ancient world exists, like believed that the spiritual beings existed. There are no atheists in the Old Testament. They all believed in, in the gods, okay? Secondly, obviously Abraham believed that God existed because he saw him a lot. <laughs> so if it was like, oh, Abraham had such great faith to believe in a God he never saw. That's just not the case. Abraham saw God all the time. Of course he believes that God is real. <laughs> It'd be as ludicrous for Abraham to say, I don't really believe that God exists as me saying, I don't really think that Joel exists. Of course he exists. He's right in front of me. He's my brother. I've known him my whole life. So Abraham's faith in God is not one in which he like believes he exists. Abraham's faith in God is something more than that. Abraham's faith in God means everything to God himself. Because here's the thing that God's learned over the last few chapters of Genesis. Humans are screwed up. They mess up over and over again. They are prone to sin over and over again. They are prone to follow the false gods over and over again. No human can get it right. No human is just. No human commits perfect justice. No human commits perfect righteousness. It's just not a thing. And But God looks at Abraham, and he looks at the way that Abraham is faithful to him. So not just like faith he believes God exists, but faithful to do what God says. Go to the land that I will show you. And Abraham in faith goes. 
God looks at that kind of faithfulness of Abraham and he recognizes, you know, that's the kind of character that I can get behind in a human being. Someone who is faithful, someone who has allegiance to me, someone who has believing loyalty in me, someone who is committed to me, someone who, yeah, they're going to sin. Yeah, they're going to mess up. And let me tell you, Abraham did that a lot. You know how many times Abraham tried to pretend his wife was not his wife so that he could, like, hide from some people? And he put his wife in danger over and over again? He did it, like, two times, and then his son did it as well because he learned from his dad. You know, Abraham took advantage of one of his slaves and basically turned her into a sex slave to try to have a child through her that in their culture would be his child. Abraham made some big mistakes. He tried to shortcut God a few times. But through it all, despite his sin, despite his mistakes, despite his unwise choices and some of the stupid and terribly stupid things he did, just like David, who did some terribly grievous, sinful, terrible things, despite the fact that David did that, despite the fact that Abraham did that, they still wanted and aimed to be faithful to God, despite their problems. They still wanted to follow after God. They still wanted to have believing loyalty to God, allegiance to God. And God does something interesting with that kind of character in human beings. He looks at that kind of faith and he says that, that's righteousness. I am willing to overlook the sins. <laughs> I am willing to forgive them. For some of the, the things that they've done. Even some of the really, really bad things. Because they are faithful to me. And so I'm willing to work with them despite their problems. So God looks at Abraham. And we talked about this a little bit last week. He decides to make a covenant with Abraham. He says, Abraham, I am looking at your faith. Your faithfulness to me. Your faith in me, your trust in me, and I have decided uh, to count that as righteousness for you. And so I'm going to make a covenant with you. What I want you to do is go out and find these animals and cut them in half. We talked about this last week, pretty morbid scene. But then you're going to put half the animal on this side, half the animal on this side. Okay? In ancient times, this was a way in which you made a promise. You both together walked between the carcasses, the halves of these animals, and as you did that, you were basically making a promise to each other, if either of us go back on the promise that we're making, may the blood of these animals be on our hands, and may we too also be chopped in half. That's a pretty crazy promise. God says, I'm going to make you that kind of covenantal promise. That goes above and beyond all kinds of promises. And then Abraham has a vision. It's a very interesting vision. Does anyone remember this story? What is it uh, that walks between the two animal halves? It's a smoking pot, which is not what you're thinking. <laughs> it's a pot with smoke coming out of it. And it's like a pillar of fire of sorts. And we don't watch God and Abraham walk between the carcasses, saying, if we go back on this promise, cut me in half. We don't watch Abraham and God do it. We watch two symbols that have been known to represent God all throughout the Old Testament, smoke and fire. We watch two symbols of God walk between the carcasses. God makes a covenant to Abraham, but God promises himself that he will make it happen. God is saying, if I go back on this promise, the blood of these animals is on my hand. God is saying, if I go back on this promise, you might as well cut me in half. See, God knows that if he promises Abraham... <laughs> 
Abraham's going to fail at some point. And God's going to be free of the promise to turn Abraham into a father of many, a father of many nations, to give Abraham a descendant. God knows if he promises Abraham, Abraham will screw this up. But within that promise is something much bigger than just Abraham having a big family. Within that promise is God eventually reaching the Gentiles. Why? Because within that promise is the ultimate descendant who will one day come, who is God himself, named Jesus. God promises himself on behalf of Abraham because Abraham has faith in God and is therefore counted righteous, God promises himself that he will make sure that this happens. That humanity will eventually be saved from sin. That humanity eventually will be raised again. Actually, it's interesting. One of the promises, one of the covenantal promises made to Abraham is you will have descendants as numerous as the, anybody? The stars. What were stars in ancient times? Celestial bodies, they were spiritual beings. So when God says, like, one day you will have descendants like the stars, he's not just saying, like, count the stars and see how many there are. Yes, he's partially saying that. But he's also saying one day you will have, your children will go on to eternal life. They will be like the spiritual beings who live eternally. God's giving hints of resurrection to Abraham in the covenant promises already. All of this. Because Abraham is faithful to God, has faith in God, trusts God, does what God says. And God sees a lot of righteousness in that kind of character in a human being. Abraham was not saved by circumcision. Why? Circumcision wasn't put in place by God for another at least 13 years after this. Abraham was not saved by the law. Why? Because the law was not put into place for another 430 years after this, as Paul says. In Galatians, Paul keeps drawing attention to this, these facts. Circumcision, the law, the kinds of things that his brothers, his Jewish brothers and sisters thought got you saved, made you one of God's people. Paul comes along, he's like, no. Abraham was given the covenantal promise, God promising himself. That all happened before the law came into play. That all happened before circumcision came into play. And Paul then looks at his brothers and sisters and says, think of the promises you make. Have you ever made a promise to anyone? And then a, a little while later, you went up to them and said, you know what? I know we made that promise. We shook on it. We spit. We matched our blood. I don't know. Whatever you weirdos do. Uh, <laughs> You know we made that promise. I'd like to come and just tweak that promise a little bit. I don't really like the way the promise was made. That's not the way the promises work. You don't get to just like go back and change it. A promise is a promise is a promise. Especially in Old Testament times when you kill an animal to say you can chop me in half if this doesn't work out. You don't go and change the promise. And Paul points that out in Galatians. The original deal made with Abraham was not... Uh, to follow all these laws and to be circumcised. The original deal was that faithfulness was righteousness. And all those other things came as continuation of what it means to follow God. So we are now seeing that Abraham was not necessarily saved by how he lived, by how moral he was, by how good he was, because he failed over and over again. God knew that. God saw that. And God calls him out on that. The test at the end to sacrifice his son Isaac is like the ultimate test. Abraham, you have shortcut me over and over again. Yeah, you've still been faithful and you've believed that. That ultimately I would give you this descendant. Now you have the descendant. I've given it to you. You shortcut me all the other times. You're going to hold that back from me too? Prove it. Prove to me that the descendant, that is the promise I've given to you, that you would give that back to me. Because that hasn't been the way that you've been acting throughout the last few decades. But Abraham has grown in faithfulness and trusting God in righteousness. And Abraham knows 
Okay, yeah, I'm gonna do that. Of course, I think Abraham also knew that God wasn't gonna make him do that. It didn't make any sense. This was the promise God gave him, and he knew God's character better than that. And God stops him, proving, of course, I, I, am, a, I am a God who would never have you sacrifice your children. That's not my thing. I consider that an atrocity. Don't ever do that to me. But then God finally sees in Abraham's final days, yeah, you're willing to go the distance. You are willing to be faithful to the bitter end. That's the righteous character that I have found in you. All that on the table. Let's now read Romans 4. If you want to read it with me, I'm in the ESV. Romans 4. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. To so the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? Remember, the Jews at the time, all these Gentiles coming in, the Jews are looking at these Gentiles and saying, if you want to join our faith, you're going to have to get circumcised. Paul's doing a proof text here. Abraham wasn't when he got saved, when he was counted righteous. Abraham received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. And to make him the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but also who walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Pause right there really quick. Where did Abraham's story start? He wasn't one of God's people. Abraham is both the first person within the covenantal promise of God, but he's also the first Gentile that God ever reached out to. First pagan, the first outsider, the first one outside of the law, the first one outside of circumcision. So Paul is trying really hard in Romans to try to explain to his Jewish brothers and sisters why the Gentiles can be brought into the faith, why they are saved by Jesus. And he's got to call attention to the original God. That guy also was a Gentile. That guy also was uncircumcised. That guy also didn't have the law. And yet God brought him into the faith. So he starts there. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Interesting. Abraham's not just talking about how Abraham will, sorry, Paul is talk, not just talking about how Abraham will inherit the land of Canaan anymore. Now it's the whole world. Why? That's what resurrection's about. Paul loves resurrection. One day, there will be a new heaven and new earth and everything will be made right and we will inherit all of that. That's in the promise of Abraham. For it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs. Faith is null and the promise is void. For the law, sorry, for if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and promise is void. For the law brings wrath. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. 
That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence things that do not exist. Paul, again, looks at Abraham's promise and shifts it. He's not just getting the land of Canaan, he's getting the world. But Paul also sees that Abraham is not just, uh, not just going to have many nations birth through him, like Esau's nation and Isaac's nation and, and uh, um, Ishmael's nation. He also sees that through Jesus, all the nations of the world will be brought back to God. They were disinherited at Babel, but they will all be brought back through Jesus. So Paul is extending what Jesus has further done to, to the promises given to Abraham. In hope, Abraham believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness, or deadness, is another way you could interpret that, of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who is delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Close out with something that may sound a little startling. We often think of salvation by faith, that that's a new thing that happened with Jesus. I would propose to you that salvation by faith has always been the case. In fact, I would propose that that was Paul's whole point right here. In the last chapter, we saw that a lot of the Jews of Paul t Paul's time thought if we could do the right works and live by the law rightly, then we would be saved. But Paul calls their attention further back and says, was that ever really the case? We've always been bad. <laughs> We've always messed up the law. The law has always told us that we're sinners. Therefore, we have always only been saved by grace in the first place. Abraham was saved by grace. In fact, the law, the law had grace written into it. Grace was that Israel was not chosen because of anything that they had done, but because God promised himself to, to Abraham that he would take care of Israel. That was grace. Israel was chosen because of God's grace. Israel became elect because of God's grace. Israel was saved from slavery and tyranny because of God's grace. Israel was given the law, and within the law was written a service for their sins to be forgiven every year <laughs> because they would fail over and over again. That was God's grace. A lot of times we look at the Old Testament and we think, back then God just wasn't gracious. Back then it was just, uh, could you live good enough? But I would suggest to you that Paul's whole point in Romans 4 today was to show us we have always only been saved by grace. Furthermore, what Paul wants to say with that is now that Jesus has entered the picture, we see that it is all about grace, just as it's always been. Why? Because while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. That was grace. Jesus didn't die for righteous people. He died for murderers. He died for liars. He didn't die for you on your best day. He died for you on your worst day. 
But within Jesus, there is a promise of resurrection. There is a promise of the life to come. There is a promise of the inheritance of the world. There is a promise that your sins are completely forgiven. There is a promise that on the day of judgment, when you go before God's throne, though you'll be judged for everything, the verdict has already been declared over you. You're in because of your faithfulness, like Abraham's faithfulness. Despite your problems, you are in, you are saved, you are made free. That is not to say that we don't do good works. That is not to say that it doesn't matter what we do or how we live or that we can live in immorality. It's not to say any of that. For all of those things are a part of faith. It's a final passage I'll share. In the Jackson Cloud, we came across this passage and it kind of startled me the other day. Maybe I'll post the episode up on our Facebook page later if anybody wants to go a little deeper. Um, here it is. Genesis 26, 4 through 5. When God gives the same covenant promise to Abraham's son, Isaac, here's what he says. Isaac, in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Why? Because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Just super interesting since the law didn't exist yet. But because Abraham was faithful, believing loyalty, allegiance to God all the way to the end, God looked at him and saw in Abraham that that faithfulness counted as fulfilling the whole law in the first place. So that's you in Jesus. The fullness of the covenant promise made to Abraham that God promised himself he would make it happen. That is all found in Jesus that has been given to you. The crux of everything in all, all of history has changed. Your life is not dependent upon if you can fill out 600 rules perfectly. Your life is dependent on can you be faithful to Jesus. And if you are faithful to Jesus, not only will you be fulfilling the law, but you will also be trying to live by those 600 rules not just as they're written, but what they actually mean. Because Jesus clarifies that we don't always know what they mean. Murder is hating someone, Jesus clarifies. Adultery is lust, Jesus clarifies. But if we're obedient to King Jesus, all the promises that are found in him are given to us. And that faithfulness is counted as righteousness. When you get to heaven, you don't have to be afraid. With all that being said, let me pray for you. And if there's anyone here who uh, would say that they're not allegiant to Jesus, that they don't have believing loyalty in Jesus, that they don't feel like they're within the promises that Jesus offers us, the good news for you is that you can enter into that very easily. All you have to say is, God, I... I want to have the faith in you. I want to have the trust in you, the allegiance to you, the believing loyalty in you. I want to call you king. Saying things feels pretty easy, but here's what follows next. You then have to live a life that shows that he really is your king. That you actually are allegiant to him. Yes, you're gonna make mistakes, but your life should show, and your works should show, your good works should show, that you truly are following Jesus. Many of us have been on youth group trips when we were growing up, where someone joined us for that time. And everybody ran up to the altar call, and that person that we weren't used to coming to a youth group also ran up for the altar call. And their lives were extravagantly changed in that moment. They were crying their hearts out. They were giving their lives to God. And when we all got home and we went back to school the very next day, it was as though that thing had never happened to that person. 
never saw them again. They popped their head in every once in a while, but the fruit of their lives did not necessarily strike us as though they really still considered Jesus king. Many of us have been that person. That's a dangerous place to be. Only Jesus can make the judgment call as to if we truly have faith in him or not. We can't judge that in someone else. But when we see the signs that it seems like someone else has left the faith, that calls our hearts to rightfully want to call them back. So if you've run away, now's the time to come back. Recognizing that Jesus tells a parable that God welcomes you back with open arms, throws a party, celebrates, the angels celebrate. That, that's, that's just like the greatest thing that could ever happen. God loves it when people come back. But if you've never come here in the first place, do it now with your words. And then recognize that the next extension of your entire life is going to prove if that truly is what you believe if you really do have faith or not because if you do you will walk as though Jesus is king there's total grace for you when you screw it up there's also a high demand to bring the kingdom of heaven to Jackson to wherever else you go so God we put ourselves at your feet we declare you king of our lives we put our faith and our loyalty and our allegiance in you and we pray that our lives evidence that. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed. Thanks for joining us tonight. We'll see you guys soon.